Number 10, knocker upper. All right, sounds a little different than its actual purpose. Hear me out. Alarm clocks, they're not great, right? They suck, no doubt about it. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real life person. What does that look like? What does that sound like, rather? At 6 a.m. That person is called a knocker upper, a person employed solely to wake up workers at mills and factories on those early morning shifts. Now, going from house to house using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows, that sounds like the best job ever, right? I can't close the list with this one. This is number 10, for sure. It's kind of fun. If you had this job, well, you're probably not alive anymore. I don't know, unless you live in a weird town. The people at the time were a lot friendlier back then than they are now, so, you know, I'm sure the knocker upper came around today, be a little different. They'd probably be on World Star the next day. Knocker upper is back in the day. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for waking me up. I would have lost $14, thank you. It was a big deal, it was definitely a big deal. Number nine. The Linkerman. Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, if you were traveling alone at night, well, you'd probably get lost. Because, yeah, even London now would get lost, you know what I mean? So that's where a Linkerman would ideally come into play. They'd come in to save your night. What they would do is they would carry with them a torch to help guide your way home. They'd be like, hey, follow me, I know these streets, and then you'd do it, I guess. It's a little scary. At the end of this impromptu tour, they'd of course expect a little tip from you. Of course, of course, thank you for lighting my path and getting me home, cheers. Here's one nickel, it's actually a lot back then. Here's one penny, there we go. They weren't so bad, they were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to B, whilst also being able to see one foot in front of the other, that doesn't hurt, especially in Victorian London. You gotta step on a dirty rat, that'll be gross. It's like a friend walking you home, only you don't know them, and it's the Victorian era, so probably pretty unsafe. 50-50 if you're gonna make it. And their charge was usually one farthing or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker man, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from that era. And there were even a couple famous linker men, famous linker mans, like Lawrence Casey, for example, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Imagine that, your arm must be so strong with that lamp all day. Ooh, it's just like, oh, I can't put it down. Number eight, ghost photography. 1800s ghost photography. Apparently it was a theme or a, a vibe, I don't know, but there were people that would take the photos of these ghosts. So at one point you would be hired as a professional ghost photographer. On paper, here's your tax returns, that's what I did. The camera, of course, was a hot new invention back then, so tales of ghost and spirit were easily believed. Especially when you have a photo of a see-through woman. That probably helps sell your tail for sure. Like, up oh, here she is. It's like, that's that's mom. That's definitely not, you just did that in the back room. That's, I don't believe you. A big name in the ghost game was that of William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849, so now he's for sure a ghost. Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister, and at the age of 22, he was appointed as editor of the Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. Yeah, this British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a spirit. Imagine that, imagine a day where somebody was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and they also posed for photo ops with ghosts. Like, can we pick a lane, science or not? What are we doing here? Number seven, lady of the evening. I talk about these ladies a lot, I know. Not because I want to, but because that's history, baby. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm window shopping only these days anyways. That's just the way she goes. A wise man once said, sometimes she goes, sometimes she doesn't. Way she goes, boys. When we think back and look at the Old West, you think of all the hardworking men and women who made the frontier possible. If it wasn't for those pioneers, we might not have the West Coast today. That means no vegan food. Ooh. That being said, the brothels and ladies who laid down their lives are a huge part of that history. Some brothels became so wealthy that they even would invest back in their towns, buying schools, medical buildings. That kind of thing. The truth of the matter is, no matter how greasy it might seem, it just wouldn't be the wild, wild west with a little girl power. Number six, rat catcher. I mean, obviously, you know what's gonna happen with the name the rat catcher. It's gonna make a lot of you out there squirm in your seats, and I apologize in advance. Hit that thumbs up, you know? Let's even out the energy. Rats in Victorian England, they were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your home probably had a dirty, fat rat just sitting there with its weird teeth looking at you. From the basement to the pipes, everywhere. It was literally a, it was a big problem. There's even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So imagine that. So of course, there's a problem. So of course, where there's a problem, there's now a job, right? Someone's got to do something about it. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era. I mean, of course, brave souls. And they were highly praised in society, but the job, obviously, wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and we'd catch them and you'd often have to kill thousands of rats every single year. And then deal with that. I don't even know how you deal with those bodies. Let's say bones, ew. More often than not, rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats, so. 
you have your own little animal posse hunting down other animals. You would feel pretty good. You'd feel like a, the king of animals almost. Probably not, eh? It's probably a disgusting job. You probably hate it every day. Number five, mining. A study done at a mine in Butte, Montana found that miners were dying from tuberculosis a lot, like 10 times more than they should be. Not should be, but you get what I'm saying. The mining industry is crazy dangerous. Safety was often overlooked and the health of these miners was, well, non-existent at the time. The first gold rush was back in 1799. This kicked off everything. A young man named Conrad Reed, he found this bright yellow rock he had no idea what it was, and for years, he and his father, John Reed, actually used it as a door stopper. Yeah, the 17 pound nugget of gold just keeping a swift breeze rolling through. It's worth a bit more than a door stopper today, and this actually ended up changing the entire industry. Gold mining got so popular that Congress had to build the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina alone. It's pretty cool. You have to make a mint? That's how much money you're making? Buddy, I want a mint. Number four. Resurrectionalist. All right, back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of their line, right? You're not gonna go dig up someone's wife and be like, hey, mind if I study her? He's like, no, please. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around to begin with, which led to a good price for bodies that were in, well, reasonably good condition to, you know, study up close, other than being, you know, deceased and disgusting. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, sure, I'll admit that. Now you've probably created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves. And that's exactly what happened. People would become their own resurrectionalist. It's a cool name for a god-awful profession if you want to call it that. The problem was so bad that people had to protect, like they had to guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. Or else these guys would come in and try and dig them up and sell your Nana for like 20 bucks. You have to stay there for four nights and guard her. That's great. No one should have to do that. The Victorian era sucked. No one should have to do that or this next one here. Number three, con men. You'll like this one guys, you're gonna like this one. There's nothing more peculiar, more strange, more theatrical than a snake oil salesman. Where would John Marston be without Nigel West Dickens? I don't know. They were traveling salesmen who were swindlers, liars, crooks, thieves, selling pseudoscience products to folks who just didn't know any better. It would work something like this. I would show up in town with my traveling cart of wares and mysteries. There, standing on a small crate, like the one I'm standing on right now, I would give the town my best sales pitch. <clears throat> Introducing Dr. Andrew's new and improved Life Vigor Supplements. Here before you find folks is a tall bottle of rejuvenation made from the finest ingredients across the globe. Ginger, ginseng, milkweed, red sage, English mace, golden currant, and as if that weren't enough, Dr. Andrew's new and improved Vigor Supplement has the minerals and vitamins that carry you through a long day's work in the fields. Vitamin A through K, copper, iron, potassium. This bottle here is not to only put a pep in your step and refill your stamina, but also cures what ails you. A proven cure for fever, chills, indigestion, cholera, yellow fever, dysentery, and even known to help heal broken bones. Modern science has brought this gift to you today, ladies and gentlemen. And all you have to do now is say yes. Say yes to rejuvenation and yes to Dr. Andrew's new improved bigger supplement. I think you guys get the point. $49.99. Number two, funeral mute. Ah uh, yes, death. Happened quite a lot back then. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, you know? Don't drop them, hmm? All that kind of stuff. Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Now Oliver Twist, one of the lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Oliver Twist is like, this one sucks, one really sucks. Mutes were required to dress, of course, in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would be to, well, to stand and mourn and not say a thing the entire time. You'd have to stand at the door of the recently deceased home and just welcome death. Just embrace it, you have to be death. The mascot for death is now you. Horrible. In Victorian London too, you're gonna breathe in a fresh rotting body. Nice, that's good. I have about four days left, thank you. And after that point, you would lead the coffin all the way to the graveyard, nice and slow, like you were uh, leading a marching band. Only it's not music, it's death behind you. And finally, number one, a chimney sweep. I remember doing this when I was a kid. Okay, I got some questions now. I'm gonna make some phone calls after this list. I had to do this when I was a kid, but back then it was a lot worse. It wasn't a chore, it was an actual job. This was a terrible job to have in Victorian London, obviously. Chimney sweeps were famously young men. Guys, I can't say anything else here, but they were young lads. That's it. History is pretty horrible, right? You could fill it in. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that made it officially illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and clean a chimney. Nice, I was 18 cleaning my chimney at home. I had no idea, I could have busted out this law and been like, actually, three more years, dad. See ya. 
just moonwalk out of there. I'm not cleaning anything. Just the kitchen for now. I'm not using that tiny little brush. Why do all chimney sweeps have a tiny brush? Give them a bigger brush, you know? Start your list off at number 10, a banker. Today, online banking is easy, right? It's a little bit too invasive at times. I don't know. I get an email from my bank. It's like, Mr. McWaters, do you want to provide for your family? I'm like, chill, relax. Back in the old west, you didn't get a courtesy check-in email. You didn't have overdraft. In fact, the United States national banking system, well, it didn't even exist until 1863. Before then, you'd have what were called wildcat banks. And well, these were pretty fun. Here we go. What they would do is wildcat banks, they would take deposits for a short amount of time, collect your life savings, and then unannounced randomly, they would disappear overnight. Just take all your money and then run for the woods. How horrible is that? Imagine going to the bank the next day and it's gone. The bank's just not there. You're standing there with a card. Like, um, hello? Where did I put this in? You're telling me they pretended to be bankers for months at a time? Fake mustache, oh, hello sir, good morning. Stamping things that aren't even real. They did all of that and then they just ran away with all of your money. That's wild, I get it now, I get it, the wild west. After 1863, a noble profession was to work at a bank, you know, and not screw people over for thousands of dollars. The Hudson Bay Company, Wells Fargo, these are all names that began because of these fake Looney Tune wildcat banks. So next time you see your bank call, be thankful. Don't be stressed, be thankful. They've got your back. They're not gonna run away overnight. Number nine, ranch work. Alrighty, I can't do yard work. I don't know if you can tell by my physical being, but I can't lift a brick. My back doesn't allow me to reach the floor. A weird curve in the back, I don't know. Pulling weeds physically hurts my soul. Or maybe I'm just lazy. One of the two, I don't know. Either way, the Old West would have been the end of Taylor McWaters. To be a cowboy, it meant lots and lots of ranch work. It wasn't all yees and haws and kicking around. A lot of the time, you were protecting your cattle. That's stressful, right? All that meat just sitting there in the 1800s, good luck. Cowboys earned between 25 to $40 a month. Yeah, which sounds laughable now, but today that would be around $1,500 a month, which is fine. I mean, for a cowboy, I don't know, it's a bit, less than. Do cowboys get sick days? Probably not, they probably just get sick. Number eight, railroad work. This is one of the few jobs from the old west that I actively see every single day coming to work. Living downtown, they're always adding trains and bridges and not finishing any of them. And ideally, you don't want any toxic substance traveling down those lines, right? Fingers crossed. Well, back in the Old West, railroads were meant to assist the booming mining and ranching industries. Thing is, there weren't enough hands. There was not enough to keep up with the rate that they needed to. Like, who's gonna build a railroad? You know, who was the first person? Railroad workers, monthly, you'd make around $1,000, and this brought a wave of immigrants to the West. The Union Pacific and the Central Pacific Railroads, they all lay over 1,700 miles. Now, making this actual railroad, it destroyed the bodies of these workers, but without it, American history would not be the same. Couldn't imagine making a railroad that is exhausting. Number seven, grave designs. Graves, but make them cool, you know? Customize your own pit in the ground. That's fun, that's grim. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, pretty much anything floating around your mouth and eyes, it was spreading and it was bad. Not a good thing to ingest. Not an ideal time in history. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course, being gravely ill. But with this came a dark new fun trend. Yeah, here we go. The safety coffin. Yeah, let's uh, make your own coffin, DIY. These coffins, God forbid, you were buried alive while these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again. Yeah, some Tony Stark guy in the back's like, if you push this, the body will pop back out and come to life. It's like, really? A lot of these coffins were built with extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire, the safety backup wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground, and attached to a bell on the outside on the ground. So if somebody was walking by and they heard a bell ringing beside a gravestone, first of all, it's haunting, well, they know something's up and they can get them out. But folks would get creative with their safety coffins. They would ask the inventor to make them crazy things, like a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester. He had some odd requests. He passed away in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his coffin after he passed. The special door would reveal a layer of glass. Yeah, so if anybody saw any condensation, well, you know, he's still alive and get him out. Only he wasn't alive. And now we just have the world's scariest exhibit. Just a real life dead man. Let's close that back up forever. I don't want a glass coffin, that's disgusting. Number six, journalism. Believe it or not, the newspaper business cleaned up shop back in the frontier. Everyone wanted to know what the tea was. Tuscan, Arizona, for example, back in the day, back in 1831, that one town had five different newspapers. Yeah, even though there are only 465 residents, there were five different papers. That's stressful. How do you keep up with that much news? I mean, to be fair, 
before radio and television, yeah, there's probably lots to talk about all day long. That's pretty much all you can do, just talk all day long, so I get it. The industry provided jobs as well, it's very much like YouTube. Here, there's writers, there's hosts, the design and print staff, we have editors. It was a little easier than laying down a railroad, that's for sure. So when it came to jobs, yeah, journalism wasn't that bad. Definitely better than doing anything that has to do with this motion, that's for sure. Number five, gambler. You gotta know when to hold them, know when to fold them, and know when to walk away. Anyone who spends time in front of a slot machine will tell you that it can be a dangerous game. Many have claimed one at big, all whilst envelopes with red print pile up at the front door. Final notice? Pfft. That means another spin, baby! Well, this is a similar story of the Old West, but instead of a one-armed bandit, there were actual bandits with two arms uh, and guns. <laughs> Yikes. It's a game of poker, lies, bluffs. Playing the wrong hand could wind up turning sour. The gamblers are the type of guys who roll into town in the shiniest clothes and stay in the best places. And right before you notice you've been cheated at the poker table, he's already cashed out. Number four, law enforcement. Of course, this too was a little different back in the Old West. There are not many body cams back then, I'll tell you that for free. Movies and television, they like to show the Old West as a lawless, rootin' tootin' time. And while sure, some of that is true, it wasn't as terrible as we think. Like a million ways to die in the West, Red Dead Redemption, it wasn't that crazy because before any formal law enforcement agency did pop up, everybody was a bounty hunter, right? Why not? There's nothing else to do. Go lay a bunch of bricks or go catch a bad guy. 50-50, both are quite dangerous. Eventually, positions like that of a US Marshal began to pop up more and more, and well, now there's a bit more order to the system, that's for sure, a bit, just a little bit. Number three, train engine cleaner. Yeah, this one's gonna suck, it sounds yucky already. For this job, you were required to get into, of course, pretty tough positions to, well, clean the engine of a train. Train engine cleaners would have to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out all that coal that was left over. Yeah, as if shoveling the coal in wasn't bad enough, now some guy's gotta crawl under and shovel it all out. Nope. They go underneath the train with a dusty ash pan and they work away all day long and nights. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains and then spend their nights climbing into the same furnace to clean it out. Every time I watch the Polar Express, it's always so magical, you know, it's always a great time. But even on the Polar Express, there's a guy shoveling coal all night long on Christmas Eve. You know what I mean? That's how bad this job is. Magic can't even save it. Couldn't even picture a worse job to have with this goofy back. Imagine that, imagine me doing this all day. No way, I'm gonna make it one week. Number two, resurrectionalist. Yeah, you don't see a lot of these guys around anymore, eh? Wonder, wonder where they all went. A resurrectionalist is exactly what it sounds like. It's very gross, you're trying to bring someone back to life, I guess, not really. These guys were responsible for digging up dead bodies and then they would sell them to medical schools in the West. Now, remind you, this was the late 1820s, so yeah, it was fine, I guess. This practice began in Edinburgh, Scotland. The medical science community was on the up and up, but in order to study new medicines, you know, to avoid the next plague or the next toxin rolling through your system, they needed these guys to come in and do the dirty work. Today, the medical community is a bit different. We're a bit, you know, smarter with things, but hey, never say never, a resurrectionalist might come back to life and be a new profession. How ironic. And finally, number one, medicinal showman. Ah, uh, yes, we'll end on this note. Step right up and see something that doesn't work. A fake product. Yes, here we go, I'm doing a fake shoe. A fake shoot, a fake show, I don't know. Back in the Wild West, the 1860s to the 1890s specifically, they had what's called medicinal showmen, right? You won't believe your eyes. Do you have uh, strep throat? Come on up, here we go. Definitely gonna fix that. These guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, whatever. But it was all about the pitch. That's pretty much all they had. They would have pawns, like their buddies, run ahead into town and then plant themselves in the audience before these random medicine shows. That way, when the world's greatest showman doctor arrives, he randomly picks an ill patient that he knew was there, and then boom, just like that, he's cured. Almost like a magic show, right? Some would think, full of lies. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made by John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, and it was wildly popular. They toured with this elixir. They had to tell everybody in every town. They said it could treat any illness, but in reality, it was just a laxative. Just, uh, just a mess, just a show, really. So don't believe everything you hear, except for today. Today we're a bit smarter. Back then, not quite. Number 10, Bounty Hunter. Wanted dead or alive. The kind of thing that instills an idea of a character that would go out into the wilderness alone to hunt down criminals like Texas Cheddar over there and would be despised by all those they encountered. 
But that's not actually how it really was. You see, bounty hunters as we think of them today weren't really like that in the 1800s. Bounties were usually taken up by public peace officers, private detective agencies, or companies like Wells Fargo and Co. Many sheriffs and marshals, such as myself, Sheriff Stringbean, took up these bounties to make up for the little amounts of money they make from their day jobs. The actual term bounty hunter referred to mercenaries who would join up with an army for the bonus of enlisting. On top of that, the reward for capturing criminals like Texas Cheddar wasn't even called a bounty. It was actually called a bail. Sorry to ruin your day. Number 9. Gravedigger what does a monster truck and a weird dude from Kakariko Village have in common? If you said the foundation blocks that made up my childhood, then you win a prize. What's the prize? A big old kiss from me. Mm. In all reality though, towns in the Old West were interesting places, where there were always two constants. Sand, and folks would probably end up in the ground, or that sand. So after the proper proceedings had taken place when someone croaked, it was time to dig a hole, or in these poor souls cases, a lot of holes. Cholera outbreaks would keep a grave digger busy for days. However, I thank the grave diggers for their service. I mean, someone had to do it. People like to give them a bad rap because they spend all their time with cadavers. That doesn't mean they're weird social outcasts. Well, except for Dompe and, and Seth from Red Dead Redemption and well, the, the ones from Hamlet. Those guys are pretty weird, actually. Oh boy, maybe we should just keep our distance from them. I don't know, I'm getting out of here. Number eight, saloon owner. Saloons are about as synonymous with the Old West as a single tumbleweed blowing in the wind, moving from stage left to stage right. Just about anyone could be a saloon owner too, from Festus down the street to the previous sheriff to a fancy gambler. The saloons of the Old West outnumbered churches 100 to one, and are any of us really surprised? You'd see one general store, one doctor, if you're lucky, and then like three saloons all on the same street. It's actually probably one of the most usual jobs on this list. It was also one of the most accessible jobs, usually being what people turned to when other avenues of employment ran dry. It would even be what you did while saving up money to buy farmland or to run for your office in your government. And in a town where everyone and their moms knows you as the guy who serves the liquor, you ain't gonna have a hard time getting elected. Ah, I kind of want to be a barkeep now. Number seven, blacksmith. All right, close your eyes and imagine a blacksmith. Just any blacksmith from any time. Is he bald? Does he have a massive beard? Is he incredibly strong and wildly intimidating? Yeah, that checks out. That's what a lot of them look like. Missing teeth, banging something pretty loud. That's a blacksmith. Frontier times were almost a golden time for blacksmiths, believe it or not. Hammers, horseshoes, new railroads. It checks out. No, they didn't need any chain mail, but a saddle wouldn't hurt, that's for sure. We could use a saddle. They would earn up to $200 a day. Blacksmiths were always busy in the Old West. They doubled as auto repair services really at the same time. I mean, I don't know. A guy comes in with a busted up carriage. Well, now you're a mechanic. Yeah, go fix this wooden car. Good luck, you have one day. Here's 10 bucks. Number six, a banker. Look, it ain't really unusual, but you get shot at a lot. Bank robberies were not just in movies, no sir. To be a banker these days came with the territory of inviting unwelcome weapon-wielding bandits to hold you up. Apart from robberies, these banks had pretty much zero regulation too, so fraud and mismanagement was pretty commonplace. It's almost safer to keep your savings in a vault at home. Almost. A lot of the time, these banks were just a couple of fellers in town who teamed up, pulled their money together, and opened a community bank. You can kind of guess how this probably wouldn't be the most trustworthy of monetary dispositories. But they were absolutely essential for some people, especially those in the cattle business where you would see around $50,000 to $100,000 exchange hands in some of those transactions. That's a lot of money back then. Heck, that's a lot of money right now. To me at least. Applications for a sugar mama will be received in the comments below. Number five, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing back in the Victorian era, obviously. I mean, they definitely existed. The first lighter was invented in 1823, but it wasn't like the ones we have now, not like those Bix that still don't work. It wasn't a portable thing. The first match was invented in 1805, but it kind of sucked. And the first friction activated match came around much later in 1826. This one here changed the game for good. They were made with white phosphorus, which is of course extremely toxic, but they didn't have machines to make these matches. Matches. No, it was of course done by people, young women. It was only women that had to do this and in the worst of conditions, of course. And before you ask, no, they didn't understand protective gear. Well, they did a bit, but even so, women didn't get that kind of luxury, right? They didn't get that treatment. These girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would probably end up ingesting said white phosphorus. The entire shift. History is horrible. Number four, milliner. Hey, I have a proposition. So we have hats for men, right? Now, 
What if we employ someone for the sole purpose of, get this, making hats for women? Well, Jebediah, uh, we have that. That would be the uh, milliner down the road there. If you were a high fashion lady in the 19th century, then you would have definitely come into contact with these fine sellers and makers of women's hats. They were usually located in bigger cities where the higher end families would either live or spend their time. And you should take a look at some of these hats. They are works of art. Maybe some are a little whack, but hey. Number three, barkeep. All right, I love pubs, big old fan of pubs. Never been to a Wild West rootin' tootin' pub, but I'm in no rush. They always have weird drinks like venom snake juice or whatever, like spider ale. I'm like, I don't want any of these poisons. How about a beer? Just a beer, thanks. Bars in the Wild West, eh, not so fun. Not a lot of open mics going on back then in the 1800s. No karaoke night back then. See, back then, these saloons were just for business. That's it. You don't have a mustache and a business plan, get out. In the 1850s, saloons would price their drinks depending on how far away you had to travel. You Imagine that. In the Yukon, their shot of whiskey was 50 cents a pop. Now, that was a lot back in the day, but if you were to ask for the same drink in a local saloon, say in, I don't know, Colorado, it'd be a lot cheaper. Pretty ruthless. That's rootin' tootin' ruthless. The odd time you would have poker, dice, maybe some guy in a piano with some jazz fingers, sure. But most of the time, business only. When saloons first popped up in Wyoming back in 1822, most of the time, it was only reserved for lawmen, miners, or gamblers. If you don't have any of those three, you're thirsty. Go gamble, go grab a dice and come back. Number two. A photographer. Want to never smile for eternity? Get your picture taken in the Old West. During the 1860s and 70s, the frontier was a wondrous, exotic place, which made it an excellent place to be a photographer. Sure, you had people who could draw and paint the landscapes and the people of the place, but people were distrusting of artists' interpretations. Pictures sold you the place exactly as it was. The high quality images were in high demand. Every government survey and all the major railroads had official photographers. Photographs made for excellent evidence of plots of land, mines, and other structures for investors. That's boring. More excitingly, common people with a bit of money would often go and get really not grim, not boring pictures taken like this. Number one, gunslinger. I bet you when someone says wild, wild west, the first thing you think of is a gunslinger. A cowboy riding his horse into the sunset with his cowboy hat and big iron on his hip. Every step into the saloon is echoed with the jingle jangle of spurs on the heels of his leather boots. No, this isn't a country singer concert. This is the Old West, the life of a lonesome gunslinger and outlaw, riding town to town, either getting away from trouble or looking for it, really. The same kind of folks who got their name up on a wanted poster. Just be sure Sheriff String be in around to look for you. That's all I can say. Also, fun fact, bounty hunting is still allowed in the US today. And that's crazy. Who would have thought? And at number 10 is jewelry making. Egyptians saw deep spiritual significance in their jewelry, but also had a love of aesthetics. And those two things combined to create some of the most unique and lavish jewelry found in history. Worn to ward off spirits, protect health, bring good luck, and more, there were even certain colors and designs that were associated to certain gods and powers. And so, Egyptian jewelers followed very strict rules regarding the mystical aspects of their jewelry creations. While a woman usually would not be a metal worker in Egyptian society, it was very common for her to be making jewelry. The tools were smaller and the process required less heat and thus less danger for her. Metal work techniques included precious metal metal sheets that were cut and shaped, notched together. Wire work was accomplished through strip twisting. Pieces could be held together with this wire stripping system or crimping techniques. These strips were also how link chains were accomplished, as well as the securing of beads or the backs of earrings. And for jewelry designed exclusively for burial, the metal was often quite thin, as the jewelry of the deceased was not subjected to the wares of everyday life. Precious stones, ivory, real flowers, and shells were all common ornaments, as was name engraved but it was more common with royalty. Jewelry makers were women of high status due to these contributions and the revelry jewelry held in ancient Egypt. For number nine, it's house vendors. Recognized as an ancient heritage profession and was at its most popular during time periods of ancient Egypt where women were restricted from going out when married. These vendors would roam neighborhoods with buckets and baskets of product for sale. Clothing, perfume, fabric, snacks. Now, what was unusual is that the vendor was more often women than men. Walking the streets alone, making these sales, because many married women weren't allowed to go out walking the streets alone to make sales. 
You see the irony. Anyways, this profession found great popularity in single women, and many also were called upon to act as nurses in homes of the wealthy when needed. The career is named Al Dalala, but the idea itself has long been extinct with the freedom for Egyptian women to roam commercial districts. Number eight is being a dancer. Ancient Egyptians loved their music and dance. They were celebratory, but also ritualistic at times. Farmers would dance to thank the gods for a good harvest. Dance groups would perform at banquets. People would go dance around the Nile in the lush season. The list goes on. Many men and women chose dance as a career, and it was a highly respected one. Dancing was considered an acceptable and normal part of life and even important to it. Most festivals were incomplete without it. In fact, dancing was such a revered career that dancers could start as a peasant and become a high status person from it. Just like being a celebrity in the way that people would go to see them perform. Women at the time were even more revered for their grace, elegance, and acrobatics. This career had seven types of dance. Gymnastic, movement, pair dancing, imitative dance, which was like acting like animals, group dances, like a historic cheerleading squad, dramatic dance was female exclusive and rested in illustration, war dances, grotesque dance, and then religious chant dances at temples, and lyrical dance, which was usually a depiction of lovers. At number seven, Reeve. These days we have elected officials in our communities who serve as a sort of voice of the people. Back in the Middle Ages, they sort of had someone similar to that and they were called Reeves. The Reeve was something of a local administrator and their job was to oversee the day to day running of a manor as well as to solve disputes between the peasants. The Reeve was a peasant too, but they were normally elected by their neighbors or chosen specifically by a lord and served as a Reeve for a one year period. This job eventually faded away as the feudal system began to decline, but fun fact, you can still find some reeves in parts of Canada. Number six, we meet our ladies of the night. Unlike most ancient and even modern civilizations, selling intercourse is illegal or was highly governed. In ancient Egypt, this wasn't even close to the case, but rather the opposite in a peculiar way. Women who worked in the sexual industries were considered divine and respectable, as their career was considered to please the gods. They earned high status and lived in luxury. Working freely and openly, these ladies adorned themselves with red lipstick and eye makeup that differentiated themselves from other women. They were also tattooed, diamond shaped dots along the thighs and on the fingers or images of the god Bess. When the French invaded, they brought STIs and they spread rapidly through the brothels and this prompted the French authorities to introduce a law forbidding French troops from entering the brothels or having these ladies in their rooms. Guess those ladies were hard to resist because anyone who offended the law received death penalty. Number 5. Passing Time you would assume the civil war and being part of it and everything I've talked about would give you enough anxiety, but gambling was also a common pastime in between battles. And when I say gambling, I don't mean, okay, it's nighttime, let's throw a few bucks down and play dominoes. No, they would gamble on everything. Horse races, chess, euchre, poker, checkers, cards were popular until the end of the Civil War when of course they were harder to come by, being so flimsy and all. And when dominoes and cards were out of the picture, soldiers would really go old school and play leapfrog. Yeah, games like that were literally all they had. They would wrestle each other for fun, they would have foot races and bet on them. Bowling would be played using cannonballs to knock down wooden pins. And baseball was also played, but it was a little different back then to how we remember it now. The ball was a lot softer and there was sometimes only two bases. The only way you were out also was if you were hit by the ball, hence the softness that I mentioned. On the same page, surrogates are number four. This is a widespread practice in Egypt. The first story of surrogacy found in Genesis 16 of the Bible was the story of infertile Sarah having Egyptian Hagar carry her child for her and her husband Abraham. Even Egyptian pharaohs had used concubines to produce heirs. They often married their sisters or aunts, and children born of these marriages were most of the time not in great or functional health and wouldn't survive. Any child born of a concubine for a pharaoh was accepted as as his lawful offspring. Now, they were quite limited in their rights and they could only inherit the throne in case of the absence of another more entitled heir. Surrogates experienced similar contracts and status leveling as wet nurses. They were desired to be mothers already, have a bigger, healthier body, and naturally beauty was a desired element as well. Women of low status who made a career of surrogacy often died in childbirth or from hemorrhages due to the repetitive birthing process, but for some, it was the only career they could have. At number three, cupbearer. 
Now this is a job that I wish was still around. Not because it's a great job or anything, but I feel like it could have been cool to have my own personal cup bearer so I could feel like a queen, you know? The job of the cup bearer was pretty self-explanatory. Their whole occupation was to serve the monarch their drinks. Now I know I said I would have wanted a cup bearer so I could feel like a bougie queen, but the cup bearer's job was a little more important than just serving drinks. See, there was always the fear that the reigning monarch could get poisoned because it was a very common act of treason back in the Middle Ages. The cupbearer was the only person tasked with serving drinks to the king or queen because they had to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, even if it meant tasting the drink themselves before serving it just to make sure that all was well in the cup. A lot of trust had to be put into this cupbearer so they could be quite influential in the courts if all went well. They were risking their lives and safety doing a pretty basic task, but it was for the good of the realm. Number two is professional mourners. Okay, so here's a weird one. Professional or paid mourning is an occupation not only found in Egypt, but in China, the Mediterranean, and Eastern Europe. This practice is literally paying a stranger to attend a funeral to lament, deliver a eulogy, help comfort the family, entertain, or lay on the ground way. There's some range here, depends on what kind of funeral you want to have. These paid mourners made ostentatious displays, messy hair and smudged makeup, wailing, pounding on the ground or their chest, throwing themselves about as they smear dirt and sand all over their body while they screamed. It's a full spectacle. Now, another depiction of the paid mourners in Egypt is a little more chill. Two women impersonating the goddesses Isis and Nephthys. They were believed to play a special role in someone's death. Most inscriptions of a funeral, whether they are present as paid mourners, they are on each side of the corpse and their bodies are fully shaved. These women also had to be childless and have a tattoo of either Isis or Nepsi's name on their shoulder. Most evidence of professional mourning is seen in pyramids and tomb inscriptions, such as women holding their bodies dramatically in sorrow, braced over a casket with tears flowing. If you were a theater kid, this was definitely the type of job for you. And number one, it's the female physician. Egypt is a difficult one with historians. There's been a lot of largely ignored discoveries due to the opinions of those who found them. The evidence of women in ancient Egyptian medical fields is part of that because as it turns out, their physicians were actually primarily women. Evidence shows women in the medical profession going back into early dynastic period Egypt when Marit Ptah was the royal court's chief physician in 2700 BCE. She was the first female doctor known in world history, but there is another unnamed female physician who is listed to be the head of the Temple Neith Medical School in 3000. BCE, so maybe not. But either way, the first female doctor was in ancient Egypt. Women were highly respected throughout Egypt's history, and many of their goddesses represented facets of health. Neith has been associated with the invention of birth, and Hathor represents fertility. Four deities associated with healing are Heka, Sekhmet, Serket, and Nefertum, which are all female. So, bizarre claims you may have heard that no women are involved in Egyptian medicine don't accord with the values of their civilization, which were incredibly equitable. By this reasoning, there were were no women involved in anything of no anywhere in the world until the modern era because history books make no mention of their contributions. But it's all up to say. Drew. Kicking off the list at number 10, a day in the life. So as soon as the sun came up, your life as a Civil War soldier began. You would train day in, day out, preparing for battle. It was important that each soldier knew their role to work together as a unit. Now, I would say that there's no time for fun and games, but they always made time to blow some steam off. In between drills, soldiers would do chores just like we do every day. They would cook meals, do laundry, clean gear, and make sure that everything is smooth. Passing the time was done by playing dominoes or poker. Reading was of course a popular way of passing the time as well, but it was a lot harder to get your hands on a book back then, especially when you're running around between marches and battles. So more often than not, soldiers would trade newspapers with their opponents. You would hear about the Christmas peace treaty, but this would happen as well, they would just trade papers. A soldier named Milton Barrett stationed in the 18th Georgia Volunteers wrote about this back in 1863. They said, our regiment had just come off picket. We stood close together and could talk to each other. Then when the officers were not present, we exchanged papers and bartered tobacco for coffee. They would do it when the officers weren't looking. That's the most intriguing part. They would manage this by using a small boat. Tricky, always away. The first aerial photograph was back in 1860. James Wallace Black took this photo, not by using drones or any bowling alley crazy technology we have today, but rather just a hot air balloon. This lovely landscape is the town of Boston and you're looking at it from 2,000 feet. This was a long time before selfie sticks. Even longer before that, hot air balloons were being used in warfare. The first account of a hot air balloon being used was 19... The first account of a hot air balloon being used in war was 1794. 
When the French Committee of Public Safety created the Corps de Astrosiers, which is a hot air balloon squad, they were used in the Battle of Charleroi and Fleurus, and then 70 years later, they were used in the American Civil War. They were pretty large as well, they could fit around five guys, where smaller balloons like the Eagle and Excelsior only carried one soldier. Those were for stealth flights. That'd be pretty brave. Imagine seeing a hot air balloon coming over the horizon and it has soldiers shooting at you. That's incredible. I, I didn't hear about any of this growing up. They could reach up to a thousand feet, so they definitely had a vantage point like no other, and they would communicate with soldiers on the ground using flag signals or, of course, telegraphs. The most successful balloon program in the Union was under the command of Thaddeus Lowe. He and Lincoln were allies, and Lowe actually sent a telegraph to Lincoln once describing the view of Washington from above. Call your friends more and describe your view to them. You might get a few things done. Number eight, bounty jumpers. Fewer than 150 Union soldiers were killed for desertion, and Lincoln was actually constantly writing letters and endorsements reducing soldier sentences from death to labor during the war. That's how bad it got. Deserters were a big problem for both the Confederate and Union armies, so it was punishable by death. After the Battle of Fredericksburg, the Union had 100 deserters roughly a day. That's a lot, every single day. The Union actually used peer pressure at one point just to keep soldiers from leaving. In 1863, the Union offered regiment perks if a certain percentage of original men were on for a following tour of duty. So soldiers inside were making others stay on board. How they did that, what they said, we don't know. Bounty jumpers were men who were paid to fill on the spot of newly drafted soldiers. So these guys would join for a few days and then desert them all over again and join a new post as the new substitute and get paid. And of course, some deserters were branded to avoid this problem. Wig makers are number seven. Egyptians loved wigs for a reason that surprises many. It helped keep their heads cool. I mean, it also helped with hygiene and scalp pests and looking pretty, but the heat thing is what really gets folks. Many Egyptians had shaved or cropped hair, and the mesh-like base of a wig versus a head scarf allowed the body heat to still escape. And as said, wigs were also a great shield from lice or other invasive bugs. The hair used in the construction of wigs and hair extensions was always human and was either an individual's own hair or had been traded or bought. Hair itself was a valuable commodity ranked alongside gold and incense in account list from the town of Cahoon, which puts emphasis on the popularity of wigs. When hair was collected for a wig, it was thoroughly combed and then sorted into lengths individually. The Egyptians invented a variety of hair hairdressing tools and the wig makers would take the time to braid or coil the hair depending on the wig style, coating each with warm beeswax and resin fixative so that it would harden when cooled. The job itself isn't unusual, more so the booming industry it had. Wigs weren't worn to this extent anywhere else at the time and while yes they were functional against the sun, they were more so aesthetic than anything. Individual braid and extensions could also be attached to someone's scalp for aesthetics, the way that box braids, twists, faux locks, and many other ethnic hairstyles are accomplished today. Day. Wigs were made in a type of factory setting. Archaeologists have uncovered the remain of wig factories, wig boxes have been found in tombs, and multiple mummies have been found with wigs or braided in extensions. Number six, soldiers protest. One third of the Union soldiers were immigrants, and one in ten were African American, and those soldiers actually refused their salaries for 18 months to protest being paid lower wages than white soldiers. When black soldiers were signing up in the Union Army in 1863, they were only getting $10 a month, while white soldiers were getting around $13 a month. Officers were getting $700 a month too, it was just insane. To make things even worse, black soldiers were then hit with a $3 monthly cleaning fee, bringing that down to $7 a month now. So a protest was in order and it was held for 18 months, and then come September 1864, black soldiers received equal pay that was retroactive to their enlistment date. So they finally were able to send money back to their families after that long. At number five, gong farmer. Now even though there were simple jobs like being a scribe and carrying water to people, there were also some messy and not so glamorous jobs as well. This next one I'm about to tell you about was definitely one of the worst jobs that you could have. See, there was a time before modern sewers and plumbing were a thing. This was a pretty icky time because rather than waste being disposed of in sewers, they were deposited into a privy or cesspit. Now these things had to be cleaned out periodically and guess what? There were people who were hired to do just that. The gong farmer was someone who was hired to maintain the cesspits and so they would be given a large ladle and they would scoop out the waste and transport it away. Now I can only imagine how horrible that job would have been and how horrendous the smell would have been too. It sounds like an absolute nightmare so I'm glad it's not a thing anymore. Number 4. Coldest Winters with the winter winds rolling in occasionally, soldiers could no longer play baseball outside and peg each other with baseballs. But what you could do was hit each other with snowballs. 
a little fun, also a little scary. They called it a snow battle. Yeah, a snow battle too. Battle, way more intense. Soldiers would leave with bruises, black eyes, and sometimes even broken bones. Yeah, these guys were blowing off lots of steam and they would plan attacks and take it obviously seriously, as they did with their daily civil duties. Even officers got in on this action. When pieces of ice were no longer available to large units to throw at one's head, other winter games would include skating and Priestress is number three, and so while it was a male dominated field, many women were employed as a priestress or a high priestress at the temples around Egypt. Mostly from upper status, many were married to the priests, which they owed their position in society. Despite this, they played roles in the temple rituals, such as servicing goddesses Hathor, Neith, and Paquette, or working as dancers, musicians, singers, and acrobats in the temple. The most important priestress was known as the god's wife Amun. This woman was usually the daughter of the pharaoh or sometimes his wife. She usually held a very high position in court and performed important rituals to honor the god Amun. The priestress was in charge of managing the gods' affairs, attending to ritual dances and performances, shaking their rattles and rattling their necklaces, which were long and heavily beaded objects. By the beginning of the New Kingdom in 1550, the title Chantress of Amun was used, and it was usually the wives of the priests who gained these elevated positions as well. The concept of a woman as a priest was unheard of in many kingdoms. A high priestess and the reverence and traditions of female gods being led by women were unusual to outsiders of Egypt who oftentimes restricted most priestly activities to just men. Number two, the alligator. I mentioned soldiers and hot air balloons, so I must mention the United States Navy's first submarine. Have fun. This 47 foot long submarine that was paddle powered, yep, you heard me, paddle powered, so you'd be inside and just, you would do this. We can't call it the USS Alligator because they technically didn't see any active days of combat. In fact, the Alligator, that's what I'll call it, had to be cut loose on its first mission. It was being towed behind the USS Sumter on April 2nd, 1863, right off North Carolina when bad weather hit. The Alligator went down and we haven't found it since. It's still out there. The Alligator is still lurking out there. Only a few months after this new weapon went down, the Confederate States of America launched their own sub, the H.L. Huntley, and it sank the USS Housatonic near the coast of Charleston, officially marking the first time a submarine sank an enemy ship. It also immediately sank afterwards, taking the lives of eight crewmen. So even in victory, you're not safe. They made history, but only enjoyed it for minutes. This is all tragic. Number one. The wage gap. Hundreds of women joined the Civil War and they did so by looking like men. Yeah, they would pull a she's the man and get to work. But the thing is, like I mentioned before, with the CSA's currency being affected by the status of the war, soldiers were getting $13 a month roughly. That's double what a woman could make anywhere on the planet, so they really had no choice but to join. This was long before women's suffrage, so if they thought you were a man, you could use that $13 how you wanted. So it comes to no surprise that women would keep this disguise even after the war ended. In 1909, the US Army officially denied that any woman was ever enlisted in the military service of the United States as a member of any organization of the regular or volunteer army at any time during the period of the Civil War. During the Civil War though, that was the first time in American history when women all came together in a war effort. Thousands of women from the North and South volunteered as nurses. At number 10, Water Carrier. These days, we have it so easy. We have the internet at our disposal to learn about pretty much anything, we have cars to get us from point A to point B, and all of our resources are close by. We get food from the grocery store and water from the taps in our houses. But back in the Middle Ages, things were a lot tougher for people, and they had to go through a lot just to get basic life necessities, like water for example. Getting water to people wasn't as easy as you might have thought, and so that's why getting water became a whole profession. In a medieval city, you lucked out depending on the area that you lived in. If you lived close to a river or stream, then you could get all the water you wanted and pretty easily too. But if you weren't so lucky to live near this resource, then you might have had to hire a water carrier to fetch it for you. People sought out strong young men to become water carriers for them, and as the name implies, they would get paid to go to the nearest source of water and bring it back for their employer. This profession became pretty popular in the late medieval period in London, and by this time, so many people were working as water Water carriers that they created their own fraternity. At number nine, town crier. I'm sure you've heard of the town crier at some point in your life, right? They're often incorporated into pop culture pieces that take place in the medieval times. When you think of the town crier, you might also think of the famous hear ye, hear ye that is associated with the speeches of the town criers. Back in the Middle Ages, the role of the town crier was a very important one as it was a crucial way for the local authorities to communicate with the residents of their community. The town crier would 
often make announcements of new laws, royal proclamations, the start of events, and even the punishments of criminals. They were basically the news anchors of the past. Also, as I mentioned, we normally associate the town crier with the phrase hear ye hear ye, but the phrase first started off as oye oye oye, which later evolved into the phrase that we are more familiar with. Before we carry on talking about these strange jobs from back in the days of old, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, scribe. These days, most people know how to read and write. It's part of our basic education, and is one of the first things that we are taught as kids in school. As you progress in society, basic literacy is taught more and more throughout the world, as some people in parts of the world might not have access to this privilege, but back in medieval times, most of the population was illiterate, which made the roles of scribes so crucial. Not everyone had access to the right education, but for those who did and could read and write, they often became scribes. The role of the scribe was as straightforward as the name predicts. Essentially, their job was to write. Scribes were hired to write all kinds of documents ranging from letters to business contracts. One of their hardest jobs though was to copy manuscripts, which was a job that may have taken a scribe several months to complete. Many men and women in monasteries held jobs as scribes, but for common folk in villages, being able to become a scribe was seen as highly valuable as well. Number seven. Daily diet. These soldiers were all around 25 years old. The minimum age to join, of course, was 18, but a lot of these guys who were that young would often lie about their age anyways on paper. So on paper, the average was 25 years. But these guys were kids, basically. They ate mostly crackers. And when I say crackers, I don't mean the salty work snacks that you have today. These were made of like flour and water and just salt called hardtack. They would eat berries, nuts, and fruits, anything they could find is all they had. Most of these soldiers were close to starving to death. At number six, peddler. This next job from the Middle Ages is one that we kind of still have these days, just a little more modern. We're talking about peddlers. You know how there are people who go door to door trying to sell you something? Like back in the day when Avon used to do house calls? Well, this was essentially what peddlers did. Their job was to travel from village to village to sell various goods. This was how a lot of people in more remote areas were able to buy certain items. The peddler's job was pretty important for the local economy because it was able to bring business to larger areas than just one local town. It seemed like a good enough job, but socially speaking, peddlers were always looked at with suspicion. Oftentimes, local people would accuse peddlers of being criminals. Now, they easily could have been criminals, but it's really a case by case situation. You can't judge someone for just trying to get their coin. Number five are the wet nurses. Wet nurses are found in all statuses and were for all statuses. One common denominator though is that the career kind of really sucked, pun intended. So first their social status was always determined by the status of who they were breastfeeding. Royal family, congrats on your special privileges, statues, private quarters, and your own tomb in the family pyramid. Also her family would receive special perks as an extension of her. Now royal families only wanted high status wet nurses and while it's not clear how they were chosen, evidence suggests some kind of blood tie or faint familiar relation. Most wet nurses were from marginalized families in lower socioeconomic statuses and worked under conditions and pre-definitive wages. Wet nurse requirements for any status were intense. She'd have to have given birth at least twice, have a large but healthy body due to the belief that large bodies were more nourishing. Despite that, her breasts should be medium. Too small, not enough food. Too big, the baby's spoiled. In addition to all of these prerequisites, the wet nurse should be sweet-tempered, affectionate, and responsive to her charge. She should also abstain from intercourse because it could reduce her affection towards a child, and they also said no alcohol. A good call, knowing what we know now. Wet nurses were women exploited for the products of their bodies. As slaves, they were coerced for their milk. As lower social status women, they were employed for their bodies to enhance their inadequate domestic status. Even her own household suffered physically and monetarily if a wet nurse defaulted or failed a contract. At number four, galley rower. Now, as bad as it might have been to be a gong farmer in the Middle Ages, there was apparently a job that was much worse that people would do anything to get out of, and that was the galley rower. This was considered to be one of the most grueling jobs from the Middle Ages, and I can see why. These people would be tasked with working on a galley and rowing a ship along with a team of up to a thousand other people. Apparently, people hated this job so much that they would try and avoid being picked to be a galley rower at all costs. Many people would join the pre priesthood in order to become exempt from becoming a galley rower. Usually this job would go to the poorest peasants and even slaves as it became more and more difficult to find people for the job. That was one occupation that everyone agreed was the worst. Flooding. Number three. 
Food March. In April 1863, a group of mostly women led a march to get the governor's attention. The governor at the time, John Letcher, was joined by President Jefferson Davis. It did not end well. The food situation in the South was not great because food prices changed depending on the status of the war. Outcomes of the battle directly affected prices because they were linked to the CSA's currency. That plus the fact that invading troops from the North would often burn crops when they came through, it was getting worse over time. Come April 1863, this march of women broke windows. They flipped carts until eventually they drew out Governor John Letcher and President Jefferson Davis. John Letcher literally started to throw cash at the protesters. Now they still didn't stop, obviously, that didn't solve problems. It was so bad that the militia almost had to open fire. At number two, Alewife. Speaking of drinks though, let's talk about how the drinks got into the cups and who made them. In medieval England, women were mostly tasked with the practice of brewing ale, and they were aptly named alewives as a result. Alewives were very important not only for business, but also for the good of their families. Brewing was a quote, small scale, low investment, low profit, low skilled industry, but it brought success to a lot of married women as well as a substantial amount of independence since this would have essentially been their business and their own source of income. These women would always be hard at work brewing because they sold their ale quite quickly. Ale didn't have a very long shelf life, and so they would make and sell their beverages quickly to keep up with demand and to compete effectively with others in the trade. Eventually though, the alewife was extinguished by the 15th century as brewing became more commercialized and people sought to take the independence of women away. And finally, at number one, alchemist. As you can probably imagine, science wasn't all that advanced back in the Middle Ages. There wasn't really much understanding of how the world worked. Back in these days, there were people who tried to practice science in a way that they knew how before many advancements in the field came out and these people were called alchemists. These alchemists believed that it was possible to change metals and chemicals. They tried to purify metals to change them into other things, and one of the most common experiments was trying to convert tin into gold or silver. For other alchemists though, their mission was to come up with new medicines to heal people and cure them of their ailments. Alchemists were quite popular until the 17th century as the ideas behind alchemy were replaced by the science of chemistry. I guess you could say that alchemy walked so that chemistry could run. Yeah.